Well, our thanks as always to Home Street Bank for their support of this podcast. If if you're looking for a bank that has it all, great people, great service, great rates, this is the place for you. This is my letter of choice. It should be yours as well. Go to homestreetbank.com. It's your one-stop shop for all your banking needs, both business and personal. That's homestreetbank.com. You know, we all love being comfortable, don't we? But what if that very comfort addiction is preventing you from living your best life? Let's get into it on today's episode of The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shore. Well, welcome everyone once again to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a stroll into the brain of our customers, try and figure out how they make a purchase decision and see if we can't reverse engineer our own sales presentation to make it easy for our customers to buy. And boy, are we taking a deep dive into the buyer's brain today because we're going to be talking to Dr. Mark Schoen, author of a very, very powerful book called Your Survival Instinct is Killing You. Trust me, this will be one of the most insightful books that you will read this year. And as we get into today's episode, I want to encourage you to keep an open mind because the content might make you, well, uncomfortable. <laughs> that's, that's actually a good thing, as we will explain as we go along. Uh, joined, as always, by our show producer, Paul Murphy. What do you think, Murph? Uh, are, are, are you a little worried? I'm petrified right now, uh, just from <laughs> from the description you just gave. I'm not sure. Do I want to go into this? <laughs> but that's the way it is, right? When we think about uncomfortable things, uh, doesn't our brain just naturally sort of shut off and say, oh, that sounds uncomfortable. I think I'd rather think about this over here, whatever this is. I got to tell you, my default mode is come home, kick off the shoes and sit in front of the TV. And that's yeah. not a good place to be. Right, right, right. Well, then let me take that to the quote of the day, and I'm gonna I'm gonna quote myself if that's okay, uh, and and suggest to you here that there is no growth without discomfort. There is no growth without discomfort. If it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. The obstacle is the path, and we've got to look at it and recognize that if we run away from discomfort then we are never going to be the people that we want to be. We're never going to be the sales professionals we want to be, the sales leaders we want to be, the friends, the family members, the parents, the spouses. We're never going to be the person that we're going to be as long as we are choosing to run away from discomfort. And today we're going to ask the question, how do we lean into that discomfort? How do we embrace that discomfort? Now, this is going to apply to you, but it's going to apply to your customer because this is what they're going through as well. Theirs is an uncomfortable journey. How will we help them through that? Let me give you a, a sales tip of the day that's consistent with what we're going to be talking about with Dr. Mark Schoen. I'm going to suggest that you make two lists. The first list, what makes you uncomfortable in the selling process? And the second, what makes your customer uncomfortable in the buying process? process. Two lists, what makes you uncomfortable in the selling process and what makes your customer uncomfortable in the buying process. And as you're soon going to learn, the very act of labeling these things has a powerful effect on how you respond to that discomfort. Just trust me on this. Just writing down what makes you uncomfortable and what makes your customer uncomfortable has a very, very powerful way of moving this along and helping you to find the victory on the other side of the discomfort. So just do that much. I mean, if you're not too uncomfortable. Listen, this is life-changing stuff, in my opinion. And when you hear Dr. Schoen talk about it, you're going to see this for yourself. We don't want to just simply be better salespeople. We want to be better people. So can I make the suggestion? Scrap the bucket list of all those things that you would love to do before you die. Instead, create a discomfort list, a list of all of the things that you've always wanted to do, all the things that you know you should do, but you were too uncomfortable to do. Lean into the things that make you uncomfortable. There are amazing benefits on the other side. 
Well, I'm thrilled to have on this show Dr. Mark Schoen. I, I first came across Mark Schoen when I was uh, I, I was reading an article on Psychology Today several years back, and I saw the work that he had done. It was really interesting. So then I picked up his book, Your Survival Instinct is Killing You, such a provocative title, all about how to retrain your brain to conquer fear and build resilience. I love the book personally, and I recognize that it had a huge play uh, for the people that I have. The, the pleasure and privilege to deal with on a regular basis. Dr. Schoen is, uh, has specialized in mind-body medicine for over 25 years. He is an assistant clinical professor at UCLA's Geffen School of Medicine. And along those, uh, in that uh, regard, he's been able to work with some of the uh, athletic teams, UCLA men's water polo, UCLA women's basketball. Uh, and he's really, really uh, enjoying that process as he helps them to be the best that they can be. Uh, he has been featured in extensively on television, radio, magazines, newspapers, uh, just all, all over the place. And you'll see why. A really, really interesting guy, uh, really interesting take. Please welcome Mark Schoen. Mark, how are you, sir? Yes, uh, very good. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to have you on the show. I, I want to kind of dive right in here to the book, Your Survival Instinct is Killing You, because here on The Buyer's Mind, of course, we look at this and ask, what are people going through when they're making a decision? How does stress affect that decision making? And then how do we uh, help people to make good decisions? And uh, I I'm interested in the book because right from the very start, it says that if I'm overly protective uh, of my environment, then I'm going to have a hard time making decisions in the first place. So uh, I think it's a good match here. Let me go back to the beginning, though, and ask, what caused you to write the book? What void did you see that said the world needs this book? You know, I have spent my entire career fig trying to figure out ways to use the mind to change the body. Mm -hmm. And really early in my career, I learned I could use tools such as hypnosis to change the actual components of the brain. And I learned one of those areas, which has just profound significance, is being able to recondition, rewire the fear center of the brain. And that became huge to me because what I've learned clinically is that fear has such a dominating role on our behavior, our health, our choices, that it made such sense to continue to focus on that area to see if I could make an even greater difference in people's lives and health. But you look at that fear as, well, I, I, let me just look at it this way. Having read the book, I could sort of separate out the idea of real fear or legitimate fear and false fear or perceived fear. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to guess that your take is, well, real fear has a real role in our life. It's the false fear or the perceived fear uh, that's really tripping us up. You know, that is so true. You know, our our instincts were designed to protect us, to keep us out of danger from genuine physical danger. And of course, it worked. We survived as a species. But in today's world, that genuine physical danger, thankfully for most of us, doesn't exist very often. And yet, we are still reacting from a place of physical danger, when indeed, it's more likely our perceived sense of danger and a or an exaggeration of what is really happening. It's interesting that one of the ways that you look at this, and this is what really had piqued my interest, and uh, is you describe what you call the cozy paradox. And I'm just going to read a quote directly from the book here. Despite the growing ubiquity of comfort in our lives, we have become increasingly oversensitive to discomfort, so much so that even subtle adversity and general uneasiness have become capable of inculcating fear and unsettling our physical and emotional health. That's the cozy paradox. That must have been a just a tremendous light bulb moment for you to be able to uh, kind of connect all the dots there. Yeah, you know, as I hear you say it, that sure sounds like a long sentence, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> long but uh, profound, I will say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so true is that these old uh, primitive instincts, as I was referring to, 
were designed to keep us out of danger. And the way the brain ascertains danger is if we are uncomfortable. And if it perceives and experiences discomfort, it then pushes the fear response. So what's happened is that in our highly technological evolved society, which has made our lives infinitely more comfortable, the downside is, is that we've become less tolerant of being uncomfortable, all of which means that if we are feeling uncomfortable a lot more than we should, then the fear response or the survival instinct is being triggered far more than it really serves a purpose. All right, let me just expand on that just a little bit. You say that in the, the the ubiquitous nature of technology and things that would make our life easier is is it safe to say that 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 uh, that there is a healthy sense of dealing with fear if we're thinking of it the right way, but that we have been so conditioned to being comfortable that it takes a lot less to make us uncomfortable. You're exactly right. We have become overly sensitive to discomfort. And the bottom line is, is that it makes us less resilient, less hardy under pressure. And when we have to make choices, we tend to take a or make a choice that's more about protecting us than it may be about advancing our goals. Mm hmm. Do, do you see this even as you've thought about, OK, well, there are people on this planet who have far less comfortable lives than we might here in the U.S. of A. Uh, have you seen that play out? I mean, I have to believe there are people who are just struggling for survival and uh, that would find it laughable, the things that we find uncomfortable or that we are afraid of, given what they're doing in their life. Yes. How fortunate are we that we could be worrying about things that aren't truly physically dangerous. Mm -hmm. And probably the majority of the world does have to contend with that. How do you how does this apply in your work with uh, the at the high performance world class athletes uh, in the UCLA uh, athletic department? How, how does this how, how do you use this to apply to the way that you help to make them better at what it is that they do? Well, the bottom line is that if discomfort pushes the fear response, then what we have to do is train the brain so that when it feels most levels of discomfort, that it is not in danger. So performance or competition, uh, having to perform when your team is behind 10 points or 12 points or just one point, performance competition, is uncomfortable. And so the brain naturally experiences that as fear, which then results in a compromised performance. So what I do is train athletes as well as uh, executives that when they're uncomfortable, like under pressure performance, that it no longer pushes the fear response which then allows them to excel at their highest level. I'm, I'm trying to apply this as you're talking, Mark. Uh, I'm, yeah, I play uh, ice hockey, or uh, as they call it in Canada, hockey. Uh, but, you know, when I'm out there, I play defense, right? And there are times when uh, we start scrambling, uh, where the, the other team has the puck, it's in our zone, and uh, boy, we can't clear the puck out of our zone. We can't get the puck out of our zone. And it's just a mad scramble. And boy, you feel like after a while, you're just spinning in circles, and you can feel it. You can feel that uh, there in real time, the adrenaline is going, but you're, you're thinking, oh, no, I, I am out of control. I, I don't know how to get on a guy, and they are going to score. Uh, there is that very intense moment of pressure, and I think it sometimes happens actually for sales professionals in the middle of a sales presentation where it's like, oh, there's an objection. I'm losing control. And the problem is uh, I stopped thinking clearly. Why? Yes, when that pressure and the fear of making a mistake or, or not getting it right, when the fear response goes off in the brain, it's called the amygdala, it essentially steals the blood supply from the part of the brain that's involved with decision making, uh, with executive function, being analytical, logical. And when it takes that blood supply from that part of the brain, it's like 
an electrical power outage, lights start going off, air conditioners don't work. And that's the same thing that happens with us. We just don't think clearly. And then we are basically acting from a place of fear, which means is that we're trying to limit our losses far more than we're trying to make our gains become more probable. Mm -hmm. well, it's interesting. We had uh, uh, Dr. John Medina, uh, who wrote uh, Brain Rules on a, a couple of months back, and he was suggesting that we actually, that some of that blood supply that we lose out of the brain goes into our legs. It is that primitive in us that prepares our legs to say, run, get out of <laughs> get out of here. It's amazing kind of how that works, where we tend to look at it and say, it's all psychology. It's all just just about the way we think. But what, you, what we've learned more and more, especially over the last 10 to 20 years, and I know this is your specialty, is that you cannot separate the psychology from the neuroscience of, of what we're seeing here. Yes, you know, the mind and body are inextricably intertwined, and it's hard to separate them when we talk about these type of things. They just go hand in hand. And so when this part of the brain, this primitive part of the brain, essentially takes the reins or grabs the steering wheel, the more logical, or even adult part of us is thrown into the back seat and taken for a ride. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about how this fear, this discomfort, this perceived as fear affects decision making, right? There are times when I look at it and I say, uh, boy, you know, I, I really want the shoes or I really want the car or I really want, you know, whatever. And the want desire is so strong and uh, it's within my budget. And uh, I, I've been thinking about it a long time. There's not a lot of stress there. There's not a lot of discomfort. It makes it actually enjoyable to make the decision. But there are other times when there is discomfort, where there is fear, where there is the unknown. How does that perception of fear and discomfort affect our decision-making patterns? The sense when there is more at stake, and that's a very important distinction, when things feel more at stake, for example, we feel like we could lose a lot of money or people are going to judge us or we're going to feel like we could lose something. When that is on the line, that's when that perceived fear is exaggerated. And so when it is exaggerated, it also, of course, exaggerates the risk and then misrepresents reality. So we are reacting to a world that's not necessarily an accurate replica of what it is. Uh, that's uh, just brilliant. I was just writing that down because I have a, I have a feeling that direct quote is going to go in the book at some point. <laughs> that is uh, such good stuff. Uh, and, and it's not an, an accurate uh, replica. So there is that sense of you know the, the old uh, hackneyed trite acronym of false evidence appearing real. That's that's not just some clever little saying that that's really what's happening right here. Yeah, you know, you think about, you know, how we were talking, how, how our primitive instincts work. You know, they were designed in such a way to place a ton of emphasis on what happens around us. Mm -hmm. So our senses, what we see, what we hear, what we feel, what we think, we're given a lot more emphasis because the threat really existed on the outside. The downside of that in today's world is that we tend to overemphasize what we think or what we sense. And the, the downside of that is that we experience threat much more than what is genuinely there. And what's our instinct then to do if we've been wired to overemphasize the importance of the outside? Then we get stuck in trying to control the outside. The more we try to control the outside to sort of attenuate our risk, the more the outside controls us. Hmm. Hmm. And, and what's very important about that, that has great application, the more we are being controlled by the outside, the more we are separated from our potential and inner resources on the inside of us to manage the situation better. 
in the book, you refer to this as externalization, uh, the, the idea that we are, uh, just correct me if I'm wrong on this, the idea that we are increasingly um, more influenced by exter external factors than we have been in the past. I think we have always been influenced by external factors. That's just the way we're wired. Mm -hmm. The problem is in today's world, it just makes less sense because there is less external danger. So part of the evolving of our species of learning to rewire and retrain our instincts is to also retrain our dependency on controlling the external factors. Not that we want to be oblivious of it, of course not, but we want to bring it back into a place where it merits not in an old place where there was danger all around us. How do we, let's talk about how we help people when they are stressed. So so I want to think right now about a sales professional who is working with someone who's, you know, it's a young couple that's engaged and they're, they're considering buying a, a diamond ring that's going to be uh, arguably the most expensive purchase up to this point in their life. Or, or someone who's thinking about buying a car or a home. It's a big decision. There is an emotional side of it that says, I want to do this, or we wouldn't be talking to a salesperson in the first place. There's also an emotional side that says, this is big time scary. And all of these discomforts and fears that that customer is going to be dealing with are going to be present in this big decision here. What advice do you have for a sales professional who is, you know, they're, they're, they're not a, a, a clinical psychologist. They, they, are, they are not trained in this way, and yet they have to usher people through this difficult uh, process. What advice do you have for the practitioner, the frontline influence practitioner? You know, our natural instinct is when we see someone afraid is to try to talk them out of it. In other words, no, you shouldn't be afraid. No, you shouldn't be worried. Now, for most people, if you tell them not to feel something, it typically magnifies that feeling rather than muting it. I think it is far better to talk about the discomfort in a direct way, because we know that when we acknowledge discomfort and label it, that part of the brain that is really ramped up in those situations, it quiets it somewhat. So labeling makes fear and discomfort less. Why, why is that? I've, I've heard this before. I find it really interesting. The very act of labeling something, labeling a fear, labeling a discomfort, causes us to be able to deal with that more proactively, more successfully. What is it about labeling something that that is a, a viable and valuable technique? Well, if you think about this, fear is like a, a train. So if we have a certain situation, certain stimuli that is associated with fear, whether it's spending more money, buying a ring, uh, making a big investment decision, it automatically takes like a train from that condition, a one-way train to the fear part of the brain. But what we want to do is make it so these uncomfortable situations, rather than being a one-way train to the fear center of the brain, that they go to other parts of the brain that have nothing to do with fear. So by bringing in other parts of the brain, we, in a sense, make the fear center's contribution less. It's like if you had a, a rainbow and it was just red. Well, what if we start bringing some blue and green and magenta and teal and, and so on? The amount of red in that rainbow now seems less, even though it may be just as large as before, bringing in these other parts now makes it feel more dwarfed. So the same thing has to do with labeling. By labeling and focusing on that fear, even though it seems the opposite of what our inst instincts would tell us, we are bringing in other parts of the brain. So, so 
it's just correct me if I'm wrong on this, but that fear doesn't reside in the most advanced part in a, the you know the the prefrontal cortex of our brain. Uh, it resides in the emotional center of our brain. It, 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 if it's a supreme fear, even back into the uh, amygdala, uh, but the labeling takes place in the more advanced part of the brain. Uh, and, and when we do that, we sort of move away from the emotion. Is did I hear that right? Yes, what we're doing is if we have that one-way train that just keeps going to the fear center, and now we label it, that brings in like what you're talking about, the, the frontal lobe of the brain. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't have a, a link to the fear response, and so it's bringing in a different part of the brain. So now we are better able to balance it out. Give us, we're just about out of time. Give us a, a starting point. Give, give us a, uh, if you could give us an exercise. I, I'm, I, I want to recommend to people, of course, that they buy the book. And, and I think just based on this conversation, they're going to want to buy the book. But give us a starting point, an exercise, something that we could say, here's something you could do right now to help deal with uh, this survival instinct that is otherwise killing us. Okay, I'll give you some uh, good examples. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do here again is make it when we're uncomfortable that it doesn't push the fear response. That's the goal. So we want to essentially build up this discomfort muscle so that when it feels uncomfortable, rather than going to fear, it then allows you to still perform at your highest level. So... There are several exercises I'd like to recommend to people. Mm -hmm. One I've used for years is to have people go into uncomfortable situations. One is you go in, stop people along the street or different places and ask them for a favor. And in your mind, you're going to ask for something that may be ridiculous. Maybe you're going to ask someone for a ride. Uh, or maybe you're going to ask them for $100. Or maybe you're going to ask them to let you into the building, even though you don't have credentials. And or let's say you're going to ask someone out for a date. All these things create a level of discomfort because we're worried our old instincts don't like to be rejected. Remember, that's something at stake. So rejection, judgment put us in a place where we feel uncomfortable. So what we're doing is putting ourselves in an uncomfortable situation, but we remind ourselves the goal is not necessarily to succeed and have that wish granted by this person. The goal is just being able to do it and not be afraid of it. So from that perspective, in that exercise, it would be better to pick something that you know in advance that somebody is going to say no to because uh, it, it, you, th there's no competing goal. It's not like, well, I really hope they do give me $100. Nobody's going to give you $100. You know they're not going to do it. The key here is that you could hear the word no, and it, you're not going to die or nothing. Exactly. You learn that the discomfort does not put you in danger and you don't die. Mm -hmm. That's a really good one to do. I, I also recommend to people, I've done this one for years, is have them take an improv class. Hmm. You know, because a lot of people are very scared of uh, public speaking and and so on. Uh, and they're, but let's just say these are too high stakes that someone's not going to do these because they're just too much. Well, then you start at a much lower level, putting yourself in situations that are uncomfortable, but a low degree. For example, one way would be to perhaps go to a destination you've never gone to, driving that is, without using uh, your phone for, for directions, or to take a different way to work, or to listen to some music that you don't really like, uh, or to read something that you find very uncomfortable. Uh, so all these help. Uh, when I do this with my students, I essentially do that. I keep amping up the level of discomfort. One thing I have them do is I have them come in starving. Sometimes I have them come in sleep deprived. Other times I put them under some intense competition with each other. All these things start building up that discomfort muscle. 
His name is Dr. Mark Schoen. His book is Your Survival Instinct is Killing You. Uh, you can go to markshoen.com, M A R C. S-C-H-O-E-N.com. We'll put that in the show notes. Uh, while you're there, uh, make sure you check out his speaking page. If you've got a uh, conference coming up, you're looking for a great keynote speaker, what a fantastic opportunity from somebody who uh, can really, really challenge your audience. This is a, a great opportunity, though, in the, the short run, buy the book. I, I'm going to tell you this. This is one of those books that uh, it's not that I got a lot out of it. It's that the book got a lot out of me. It was a very very, very powerful read. I want to recommend it to you. And even as you listen to this conversation with Mark Schoen, uh, y- you can tell that there is work to be done, that this is a not a destination as much of as, as it is a journey. But when you take that journey, amazing things happen. Uh, Dr. Mark Schoen, thank you so much for being on The Buyer's Mind. Yes, thank you so much for taking an interest in my work. I appreciate that. Well, there you have it, Murph. Uh, another great conversation with another brilliant guy. Um, I just really, really impressed with his life's work, his opportunity to say, this is the difference that I want to make on this planet. Well, it's interesting because we I don't think we think about fear uh, that often, but we all experience it, whether we know it or not, and are reacting to it all the time. Yeah, no, absolutely. But that, but especially from the perspective that the, the difference between real fear and discomfort that masquerades as fear. And of course, that's something we talk about in the buyer's mind on a regular basis. And it's something that uh, buyers have to deal with. It's also something that salespeople have to deal with. We get in situations where we feel discomfort and we interpret it as fear. And it's not really fear. There's not anything really to be afraid of. I think that was Dr. Schoen's point, right? Well, yeah, so I, I just have to ask you, can I have $100? No, but good for you for... <laughs> <laughs> and look, yeah, I, I want to point something out. You didn't die or nothing. You asked me for $100, you got rejected, and it's still all good. Uh, I, I love that, and, and it's it's a great way to be able to, uh, to train that... Um, Uh, that discomfort muscle. This is something that I talk about extensively in my book, Be Bold and Win the Sale, that over and over again, salespeople uh, who are struggling with discomfort, it's it's because they they have that weak discomfort muscle. They they don't do well with discomfort. But the good news is you can, in fact, strengthen that discomfort muscle. You can uh, decide in your brain how you're going to respond in advance of your discomforts. And it makes all all the difference in the world. The fact of the matter is that we are fighting our own primitive brain. Our primitive brain is gonna tell us, run from the discomfort. That's bad advice. And if we can look at it and say, if we can label it ourselves as salespeople and say, nope, that is not real right there, that is discomfort, but it's not danger. And I should lean into that because as we've often said here, The obstacle is the path. The obstacle is the path. It's not on the path. It's not in the way of the path. The obstacle is the path. There is no growth without discomfort, period. I don't care what you're trying to do. There is no growth without discomfort. And I want to encourage you listening today, embrace that discomfort. Think of something that makes you uncomfortable right now and recognize that if you can bust through that discomfort, there's something magical that happens on the other side. This is what we learned from Dr. Schoen. This is what we have to internalize, the idea that our brain is giving us false signals. Don't let your brain do that. Control your own brain. Recognize that on the other side of discomfort is wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Well, there you go. Another episode of The Buyer's Mind. If you're enjoying the podcast, make sure you subscribe to that. We'd really appreciate that. Leave a review if you wouldn't mind, too. But that's another wrap on our podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. You can find everything you need at jeffshore.com. But until next time, my friends, go out there and change someone's world. Someone's world.